Hey folks, thanks for joining our Monday Mindshare this week. Uh, Aaron is somewhere between uh, Hawaii and the mainland here in the US, so uh, he should be back with us soon, joining us uh, again on the Monday Mindshares. And hopefully over the next few weeks, we plan to introduce a number of our finishes uh, in Kona last weekend, uh, Saturday and Thursday, from the guys and the gals. And joining us today is Xander, one of our ambassadors. Thanks for joining, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. How's uh, how's the recovery doing? Well, actually, pretty good. I thought it was much harder, but um, <laughs> actually running again. So, uh, yeah. Good, good. So it's a week ago, um, and you're now back in the Netherlands. Obviously, a big change in temperature between Kona and uh, back home. Yeah, definitely. Yes, much colder and what's wet. About, what's uh, Kona was in Celsius? What thirty thereabouts? Yeah, between 28 to 30, and then with high humidity. So that combination is not something we have in the Netherlands uh, that often. Actually, never. Our summers are, if they are uh, in the 30s in Celsius, they are much uh, much drier. Right. So those were uh, conditions I uh, I need to prepare for. Yeah. Well, it's just great to have you back, and um, you've had an awesome season. We've loved seeing some of the photos from the races and particularly you've had some awesome finish line photos and we, we're, we're using some of those at S-Fuels because you're clearly just super excited when you cross those finish lines every time and we love it. Uh, yeah. 9.50.54 was your finishing time there at Kona. Yeah. 105 yeah. in the swim, five hour on the bike and 3.35 on the run. Um, 45 yeah. to 49 age group and I think you placed uh, 47th, I think, in the in, yeah. the, in the category. Um, overall, do you, do you know the number? Like, I think it was what 23, 2400 um, men races on the Saturday. Where did you yeah, end up finishing like overall? That. Yeah, I think over 500 in my category. Okay, okay, really competitive category. Yeah, uh, like the 40, 45. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, for sure. They're, they're the age group where they still think they're in their 20s, right? But uh, <laughs> they're not. Um, Qualifying race. Where did you uh, qualify? Was it this year or last year for this year's kind of race? No, it was actually last year in uh, Finland. So uh, originally uh, the race should have been done in um, October last year, but that right. wasn't postponed. But it was uh, in Finland in, in the summer. I think it was 17th of August. Okay. So I did now a full year of preparation. I didn't do any long distance this year, only only half distances. Okay. Which was great because then the preparation for Kona was uh, was perfect for me. Well, we're going to come back to Kona and just have you walk us through kind of your experience of the day. I think everyone loves to listen to those who have experienced it. It's quite a unique race itself, racing on the island. Um, but I, I do want to kind of just start with just stepping back and just where you started in triathlon and even prior to that, other sports that you, you did um, as, as, a, as a kid growing up. What's your background? Well, actually, as a kid, I was quite uh, quite active. Um, always um, loved running. Uh, never did that on a competitive uh, level, <clears throat> just for fun. And uh, actually, it turned out that I, yeah, I had a body uh, which was uh, well for uh, for running. I'm not uh, too heavy, so that's uh, that's an easy. Um, I love cycling. I've done uh, quite a lot of cycling also okay. uh, during my teenage years. Uh, I've been doing that on a competitive level, but le the amateur level, as we call it in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, some mountain biking, uh, cycle cross uh, back in the days. Uh, yeah. Now a uh, little bit more uh, gravel cycling. Yeah, but uh, not on uh, not on the highest level, uh, just for fun. And then uh, when I started uh, working, I basically stopped with the sports. I fully focused on uh, being a consultant. It's quite a, quite a hectic life. Yeah, but after ten years, I struggled a little bit with uh, with work life uh, balance, and uh, I was advised to pick up uh, sports again. So I started uh, playing uh, some some golf uh, okay. and, and started uh, running. Um, I'm not playing a lot of golf uh, these days. I don't have the time for that, but I love uh, <laughs> I love the game. Uh, so I actually started uh, running again uh, with uh, yeah with lots of uh, of joy, and uh, that started with like a local uh, 10k and then a 10 mile and right. And if you like it, it continues and uh, yeah. you sign up for a marathon and then that becomes a sub three marathon and all of a sudden you're into triathlon. So, uh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so triathlon was uh, 2014 for me when uh, I was on a family holidays in uh, in France and we were at a local uh, triathlon we were watching and uh, I was hooked. I thought, well, this is really cool. I uh, I love running. Uh, I love cycling, uh, swimming. 
I did some swimming when I was a teenager, but uh, right. not uh, uh, not the way that they used to do it in uh, in Australia, where I think every kid grows up <laughs> in the swimming pool. In the well, when you live on an island, you have to learn how to <laughs> swim, right? If you want to get off the True. island. So. <laughs> True. so I was uh, I was definitely not a, a good swimmer, but uh, started to try it on uh, back then uh, with um, Olympic distance, uh, just the local ones in the area of uh, of Amsterdam, and uh, I was actually hooked immediately. Yeah, and then uh, signed up for a half a year later, and from there it's it progressed basically. Yeah. So your first half was what year was that? That was 2016 or 17. That uh, must have been wow. uh, that year in uh, Luxembourg. Actually, uh, Ironman branded one. Um, that was changed into a run bike run because of um, oh. um, that there was no option to swim in the in the muzzle. There was just too much rainfall. And it was too, too dangerous to swim. All right. So uh, actually, my first triathlon was a run by run, but uh, <laughs> yeah, for me, it was not too bad because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty pretty decent runner, uh, I can say. Um, but I immediately struggled there with um, especially the um, some GI distress, and I think that's also why I why I moved into um, the world of Danplus and later on also Estrials to uh, to get that uh, sorted. So. Got it. Yeah. No, we, yeah, it's a very common theme and maybe we'll come back to that later. Um, your first 70.3, that was a true swim, uh, swim bike run. Do you recall what time you did on your first 70.3? Yeah, I think that was in uh, Marbella close to five hours. So maybe just above or just, just below five hours. Okay. Uh, but I must say that it's a quite uh, tough course with uh, a big hill. So it's not uh, typically right. a very fast course, but um Around around five hours. That was uh, the yeah. starting point. Yeah. And your learnings back then, when you first started, like uh, what were the from your first seventy point three? What were the takeaways that uh, you felt like I got to do more work here? Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely pacing the whole race. So that's um, uh, that's an art, I would say, because you're excited, you you want to start <laughs> to start too fast, and uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you also need to have a decent finish. And uh, that combined with also nailing nutrition. That was really my um, my limiter, I found out, because in the shorter distances, you don't use a lot of right. um, fuel or you don't need yeah. to use a lot of fuel. But yeah. as of the half distance, uh, you want to get the carbs in. And I did that completely wrong in the beginning. So basically, I, I needed to walk uh, parts of the of the half marathon at the end just just because of uh, having so much uh, problems with my stomach right so i i figured out i need to um yeah to tackle that one uh in combination also with uh, with my lesser swim abilities because i just lost so much time in the swim and then basically it's hard to get yourself into the race because you step yeah. out of the water with also people that are a little bit slower and yeah. uh, if you um if you are uh, more upfront in the in the back, then uh, it's um, yeah, it's easier also to uh, to be more competitive on the bike and the run as well. Yeah, I think so those, too. Like uh, I was going to say, getting excited, um, like you can do a lot of racing on a more Olympic uh, distance racing, and usually a lot of the Olympic races are more flat. As you get into the longer ones, just by nature, you end up doing a bit more elevation, and I think you take that excitement out of an Olympic sprint distance and then you get into both longer and usually more elevation and you find out later in the run that you're probably a little bit uh, uh, overexcited uh, in, in the run, in the bike. So um, folks, I'm going to put a link on this video just to uh, 70.3 and why people crash and burn in 70.3s. We'll, we'll give you a link to another video and we'll let you take a look at that. Uh, when was your kind of first inkling or dream of going and racing Kona? I think that was um, when I started triathlon because I was def uh, obviously looking on the internet of uh, what kind of races, what are uh, profs doing. So I can remember that when I started, I watched the whole Kona uh, episode and race uh, yeah. in the in the little hours, uh, as we call it uh, here, because, uh, <laughs> because the time difference is 12 hours time difference. Right, right. And I was immediately hooked. Um, I think it was one of the race first races when uh, Frodino uh, won, Jan Frodino. Okay, okay. Um, and back then it was just a dream. I couldn't imagine that you uh, can even finish a full uh, full <laughs> distance run. And uh, yeah, also didn't know what it, what it took to qualify for Kona, but... 
I was I was immediately hooked and then uh, when I progressed and uh, when I finished my first half distances and then signed up for a full distance and finished the first full distance that was the back in 2018 in Zurich the the last yeah. one they did in Zurich in Switzerland now it's moved to Tun another uh, place um I was actually 15 minutes after the last qualifying slot for uh, for Kona so that was an eye opener for me. I nailed the nutrition back then already because uh, I, I had a decent uh, finish. I think it was just over ten hours on a yeah, quite right. a quite a tough course, hilly course. Yeah, and it was fifteen minutes uh, too slow, basically, to grab the last uh, Kona slot. Uh, so then I made the agreement with my wife uh, to try <laughs> to qualify in the in the next three years. Uh, ah, and I did it actually in in my first race afterwards because of uh, COVID. There were uh, no races yeah. in. 2020. Uh, so 21 was the first opportunity for me in Finland to uh, to do it. Okay, interesting. And like before you, I guess, got into your full distance. What kind of hours per week of training were you doing? Um, you know, like when you were doing half distance, what kind of yeah. volume per week were you doing? I started half distance on <laughs> some eight hours a week. Uh, well constantly uh, that was obviously not a lot Uh, I didn't know that back then but uh, on eight hours I I did my first one and then I uh, started to uh, to take things a little bit more serious Um, and then it ramped up to uh, 10 to 12 hours and then I'm talking about average hours a week throughout the whole year including the um, the off season Uh, there was obviously uh, weeks uh, with uh, with some more volume but I think in those earlier years when I did half distance racing my biggest weeks were maybe 12 hours so average 12 maximum and you've been uh working with Dan I know uh on the his Enduro IQ program and I don't know whether you use his squad training programs you do yeah yeah I do get it super helpful right to structure your season um when did you start with uh, the Enduro IQ training programs that was in 2019. Yeah, it was just after finishing my first full distance. Right. I um, was working back in the days with a, with a personal trainer, a local one, but was looking for something more scientific. Um, yeah. I like to uh, to understand things and to yeah to really know also the numbers behind it. Why, why are you doing so, certain things in a certain way? And I think then with... All his knowledge, uh, obviously, around all the aspects of triathlon and the way he also presents it in his uh, weekly blogs and uh, right. yeah, the way he also um, creates that whole uh, squad co- community. I think his squad was also launched in 2019. So yeah. at, at the moment when he launched the squad that I thought, well, I need to make sure that I'm part of that, uh, that team because uh, it felt just like that was... Definitely what I needed. Uh, he got me into uh, the the low carb, high fat approach, uh, lifestyle, um, and with his support, I uh, I nailed my nutrition. So that that felt like um, the right thing to do to also get uh, into the, the the training team with him and to follow his uh, his training approach as well. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't speak highly enough of it. It's just, uh, you know, without having a coach, you know, side by side, I think it's a fantastic platform. Uh, the Zwift sessions are great too. I'm not sure how much of that you use, but certainly in the off season, I find as you build your aerobic base, just those long sessions and doing it with a community on Zwift, it helps pass the time uh, uh, when you're building up those miles. Well, let's um, let's jump into Kona. When did you actually arrive on the island this year? Two weeks before the race, uh, but I traveled from uh, Houston, Texas. So I basically traveled yeah. to the US uh, a month before the race. Um, I got some time off from uh, from work, so I took a sabbatical for this race. I really have a supportive uh, boss. He said, uh, "This is uh, this is a great opportunity, and take your time and and fully focus on the race." That's great. So I'm happy that they provided that uh, that support. Uh, so I went to um, to Houston. I have a family over there and um, okay. stayed there for two weeks to start basically the heat uh, acclimation. So I was already on a quite a high level in terms of fitness. Um, also discussed the, um, the 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 approach with uh, with Dan. Basically, I also followed his um, uh, LDT 103 course. That's about uh, okay. heat maps. Yeah. And um, so we discussed what would be the best to do with uh, the heat prep. I could already start in uh, in Europe. So in the summer, 
I had a two week uh, holiday in France. It was actually very hot, but not humid. So that was basically the first uh, phase of uh, heat acclimation, and then followed that with uh, with some sauna sessions in the Netherlands. Right. And then I went to to Houston, where it was actually very hot for for Houston uh, circumstances as well. Yeah. Um, but that was uh, that was great to uh, to have two weeks over there and then fly directly uh, to uh, to Kona out through San Francisco and my family flew uh, flew to San Francisco. So we we joined over there and then. Uh, two weeks of uh, final prep for um, for the race uh, and combined it with a with a family holiday. Nice. Uh, you don't do a lot of training, or in my taper, I didn't do a lot of uh, training in the last two weeks. Um, and actually, the um, the first days in uh, Kona felt uh, quite comfortable because I was coming from more heat in Houston. Right. And uh, the heat in Kona, only, only yeah. the humidity was quite high. So uh, yeah. Never had any issues with um, with the circumstances in Kona, but I think this definitely is something that you need to consider when you're going to Kona. If you're not from such a climate, right. that is something you need to nail. And and for some people, it's easier to adapt. And I didn't want to uh, take any risk. I want to have the the best race I could have. So I thought uh, four weeks um, that should be sufficient, and it turned yeah. out to be perfect for me. Yeah. And folks, I'll put the link down in the show notes of the LDT 103 course that uh, Xander was just referring to, which is the Enduro IQ heat acclimation course for long distance triathlon. Um, and uh, obviously we'll put down in the notes to the blueprint of the nutrition and the fueling that we're using now with Dan, uh, whether it's uh, your aerobic development courses, uh, sorry, uh, workouts, or whether it's your right up, right through to your VO2 max uh, session. So we'll put the nutrition detail in the blueprint. We'll give you the links to that. Um, okay, so you landed in Kona two weeks before. What um, You said you didn't do a lot of training. Just talk us through a little bit, though, about what you did do. I imagine you did some course familiarization, get out on the Queen K, get out into the water. Yep. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, with with not a lot. I mean, I, I'm coming from like uh, 20, 22 hours. Be, uh, that was my my uh, highest volume week before I went to the United States. So it's all relative. Yeah. And, um, I don't have the exact hours in my head, but I think it was like a, a 14 and a 12 hour uh, training week. Okay. So for me at, at the moment, that's not a lot. Yeah. Um, but I did. Um, I actually took my uh, my home trainer with me. I have a feedback sports trainer, so a compact travel uh, one. Good. Because I was not sure uh, if I could do uh, enough quality training in the islands. Yeah. And you hear a lot of stories with people getting uh, crashed uh, right. with, uh, with with cars. So I want to yeah. avoid that. And as I was located in um, in Captain Cook, which is also some some seventeen miles from uh, Kailua. Uh, and actually, that um, road from from uh, Captain Cook to uh, Kailua is hard to uh, to ride on the bike. So I took the trainer with me. So I did some quality sessions uh, during the week uh, in the house on on the trainer. And then uh, you need to think about sessions um, uh, around thresholds and some little bit above threshold just to keep uh, the body. Uh, uh, used to to the higher intensities right um, course familiarization uh, i did as well uh, went to uh, the queen k started a little bit uh, more to the north um, uh, away from um, from the start um, and then did the familiarization to Hawi, the turnaround point I really wanted to experience uh, the climb um, i had some some uh, specific gears with me so uh, a big gear for the for the descent and a slightly uh, bigger gear than normal um, for the climb. So I really wanted to test also with the conditions over there if that was the right choice because I could change back to my normal setup. What, what did you use? Uh, what were the gears you were using in the end? What did you settle on? Yeah, I, I changed my front gears to 55 tooth on the outer ring and 44 the inner ring. Okay. And 44 was more for Palani Road. Yeah. Uh, and for the rest, I only used uh, the bigger gear, and then I had uh, eleven twenty eight in the back. Uh, and I think I did the Hawi climb on fifty five twenty five. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, I, was, uh, I did. Um, I used the full gas uh, system. I'm I'm usually on Zwift, but I used full gas um, prior to the Hawaii seventy point three this year, maybe three or four times um, before I got to the island. Um, I mean, it's, 
it's uphill, but it's not ridiculous. Um, it's not too bad. But although coming down um, off Harvey, you're, you're sitting on a pretty good pace for probably 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true, true. And and and, and the reason for for having the big gears was uh, actually also the downhill from from Harvey because you right. don't want to run out of uh, gears, and that was during the race. We, we had wind from the north, and I think that's uh, not not very common on the island. Normally, you have uh, wind from the from the west, uh, yeah. the southwest. Right. But now it was uh, way different. So we had back, uh, in the descent, we also had a slight um, uh, wind from 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 the back, basically. <laughs> so on then on fifty five eleven, uh, I was able to uh, to still um, ride towards uh, people in front of me and to take uh, take over them. So uh, it turned out to be a wise choice, so to say. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, race day. I mean, uh, well, maybe, I don't know if you had wanted to say anything about just pre-race registration or anything about that. It's all pretty normal, you thought, or is there anything that was interesting or surprising? It's the whole um, experience is, is, is bigger than I've ever achieved at an Ironman race. Ironman is, <laughs> is, is very good in, in building those experiences, but uh, then having this race on the island, everything is, is yeah, a little bit more exaggerated. It, bigger. It's yeah. with the goodie bag and, uh, and everything that you get uh, and, and just having the venue on the island, it's, that's brilliant. But um, it was not completely different. I think it was just yeah. very well organized uh, in a very well uh, atmosphere. So that was, uh, yes, yeah, something to something to remember. Uh, sure. Bigger than bigger than on other Ironman races. So that's that's the, um, that experience is uh, yeah the best I've had so far. And so far, okay. Let's jump onto race day, and we'll get to maybe your learnings, and we'll get to what would you do different in a second. But um, your swim, what what uh, time did you uh, did your wave start? Well, set seven twenty five, so uh, almost okay. one hour after the the profs. Uh, they were actually coming out of the water when we uh, were heading to our, uh, our swim start. So yeah. I was I was hearing who was in the first group, <laughs> the <laughs> person, and then I uh, didn't see them back until uh, they came back from Harvey and we were riding uphill. Yeah, how magic is the water, but in terms of you get like 200 meters out and you just get this full visibility, aqua blue. It's amazing, huh? Yeah, that's amazing. That was uh, on on day one. I did a practice swim. I wanted to uh, to go uh, after the flight to uh, to the swim start, and and when you jump in the water over there and it's twenty six degrees Celsius, yeah, I've never experienced an ocean uh, which is that uh, that warm uh, and, and clear water, as you say. It's it's yeah. brilliant. You can see all the fish and uh, turtles. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Can't I imagine. remember uh, in June, because uh, the 70.3, it actually swim start is out at Waikoloa, not at Kalua. But, um, you know, we were all wave starts in June. And maybe, I don't know, I was the third or fourth wave. And 200 meters from the, the, the shoreline, we're swimming and three foot below us is like turtles that are you know, maybe a foot and a half round, but and it's just swimming straight under you. So they're totally non-phased about all of these swimmers swimming over the top, yeah. right? Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Anything? Uh, what was the what was the conditions like? You know, from what you'd experienced to what you expected, um, the swell. Um, pretty good day, or is more than you expected? I expected much worse, uh, uh, to be honest, because I'm not the best swimmer. I, I swam a lot last year. I, I practiced five times uh, a week. Okay. So I really ramped up my, my swimming because that was one of my final limiters for Kona. And I knew it was a non-wetsuit swim. Here in Europe, we don't have a lot of uh, non-wetsuit swims because of the cold, uh, right. cold water. Um, I was hoping for some buoyancy of the salt water, and actually that that turns out to be a lot of buoyancy. So I was really happy uh, experiencing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, swell. I was expecting more swell. I think the ladies on Thursday had a little bit more oh, swell wow. than we had on on Saturday. So it was really calm when we uh, got in the water. And one of the tips I got uh, was um, to actually swim all uh, to the front of the, the swimming group, regardless uh, if you're a front back swimmer. Uh, so I was uh, I was hoping for a sub one uh, hour ten swim, um, and as it turned out to be uh, uh, one or five high, yeah. 
that was uh, actually one of my one of the best swims I ever had on a long distance. So it was even a little bit faster than uh, my wetsuit swims over here. Um, <laughs> so I was it really is happy. salty water, but I agree it is quite salty water uh, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, so regarding buoyancy, that was uh, absolutely uh, not an issue. And right. if you start um, more in front of the pack and you can uh, find a group which um, has a little bit your pace or a little bit faster and you're really able to get um, uh, close to, to other people, to the feet of other people. Uh, so I actually stayed the, um, the way out to the turnaround point. I stayed with, uh, with a small group of, uh, I think, four or five uh, guys that were uh, swimming a little bit above my normal pace, but still it felt comfortable. I, I was uh, pacing on uh, RPE. I was aiming for yeah. five to six. That was also what, what Dan recommended. Uh, I think it was more six to seven when I was swimming, but I, <laughs> it, it, it still felt uh, okay. I was yeah. not burning any matches. So right. I thought, okay, let's, let's stick to this group. And then uh, when I came out of the water and saw my time, I thought, well, this is, this, this could be a great day. Uh, <laughs> it was a great day. Um, now the, uh, the run around the, uh, the transition zone, it's quite a run in Hawaii, huh? Uh, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of bikes and you <laughs> need to remember where your bike is. Uh, yeah. But that's all also also something that I practice uh, when I wreck my bike is really to to imagine where, where am I. Uh, take some pictures also so that uh, if you're in the hotel or in your house again, that you can can look up uh, right. again, where, did, where did I place my bike, uh, look up the, the, the numbers. Um, but uh, true, yeah, you, you need to run uh, quite, quite a bit there. Uh, yeah. Okay, so transition out of the swim, um, you know, every commentator always calls out uh, Polani driving, you know, just that uphill. What did you expect and how did it feel on race day? I was expecting an even steeper hill. Yeah. <laughs> because people are talking so much about it. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, on, on the bike, it's it's not a problem. Um, it's hard to blow up because it's short. I think on the run, you can blow up there, but right. we'll talk about the run a little bit later, I guess. Uh, so on the bike, it's um, actually in the, the downhill, you need to be careful because it's um, uh, quite a, a steep uh, turn to the left. Right. And some people try to overtake you, although it's not allowed. People try to overtake you over there. So don't uh, ah. yeah, don't take any risks over there, I would say. And luckily, the roads were dry. But, but I think if the roads were wet, there's also some some signs on the on, on the road over there it's uh, quite a tricky place uh, um then the climb yeah yeah you, you you need to be in the right gear so yeah, uh, and you're yeah. coming from um, from a part of the highway and uh, then it goes straight to the right and then uh, uphill so uh, you need to shift gears uh, before the turn uh, otherwise uh, you can uh, you can be stuck over there <laughs> uh, but then you know yeah if i'm on uh, on the top of uh, palani hill then queen k starts and then uh, the bike ride actually uh, really starts begins yeah. yeah 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 so i was really excited because it's the it's the hot corner you have a lot of uh, people spectators over there my wife was there with the kids and uh, ah, cool. they were trying great. to give me some information but there's so much noise so much information so much noise over there and, and people <laughs> cheering and you're excited uh, and then at the queen k actually it's uh it's silent then uh, yeah that's right it's, it's miles ahead and, and yeah. it's um you know like how did you think like the queen k it's like this kind of constant kind of uh rolling so true rolling hills but yeah. it's kind of deceiving like you think they're not that much but actually they're quite a bit of up and down when you look at it over a, the whole race right definitely definitely on the um on the television or the the, the, right. the broadcast, if you see the cross racing, you think it's a flat race, right. but it's actually not not flat. Uh, exactly right. what you what you say is rollers constantly, and we had a slight headwind. It was not a lot of wind, but it was a headwind, so that yeah. made it uh, that you need to push a little bit more than you were, was expecting, right. or that the the speed was a little bit less than you were expecting. Uh, no, definitely, it's 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 not flat, and uh, if if you're there and the temperature is rising, uh, it's it's already uh, getting quite quite some energy out of you. Yeah, right. right. And then it's noticeable, like when you're going past the airport and then you're going up to the turn uh, to go left. 
Um, a lot of that, of course, is around the lava uh, fields, but then you begin to hit the climb and actually the temperature change is quite noticeable as you get towards Harvey, right? True. Yeah, true. Yeah, and and I was um, preparing for uh, for getting uh, cooled as well. And you really need the aid stations to to cool you down because um, if you're climbing and there is there is less wind to right. cool you, then you feel your body temperature rising. Yeah. Yeah. I was also using the core uh, body uh, measurement uh, as as a device to uh, oh, cool. to see how quickly my body temperature was rising and. Um, Already at uh, the bike ride, it was more than uh, 38 and a half uh, degrees uh, that early in the morning. So that was really a sign to, uh, to nail every aid station in terms of keeping your body cool. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe uh, you can send me a note offline about that device you're using and I'll put it down in the show notes. I think people will be interested in that. Um, okay, so you're coming off Harvey. Um, I think you had a pretty much... Uh, a dry day the whole day there was no kind of uh showers right that came across uh no nah. no i think there were showers in the morning just before our race so right. it was uh, there there where it was really humid but the roads were already uh, dry right um yeah so no problem the 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 bike course is not technical at all uh, right. besides then the the small corners uh, at around uh, palani hill yeah but for the rest it's it's not technical it's really that you uh, that you need to manage your energy and um, yeah, be smart on the road also with uh, groups because we had wave starts. Uh, so the the less fast uh, athletes from from earlier uh, waves, uh, they were actually falling back, and you need right. to to pass them, but you need yeah. to follow the rules of your fleet. So yeah. it's almost yeah. riding towards a group and then taking them over um, and putting in a little bit more effort to to pass within the the time you have to pass. Um, and that's also something that you really need to uh, to consider. You cannot um, pace yourself completely even because of the hills, but also right. because of the race dynamics. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, on the side of the roads there in Hawaii, the um, there's these kind of um, like uh, little routes things. Uh, they're actually quite uh, quite deep. I don't know if you found that, but uh, yeah. as you kind of sit on the right hand side of the road, and if you have to come out and pass someone, you got to go through those ruts um it really shakes the bike so that was kind of noticeable to me Um, yeah that's that was that was uh, uh, nerve-wracking sometimes and i was really uh scared to to getting a flat uh, because of (laughs) that but luckily everything went uh went uh went fine but that's that's definitely something to uh to be careful with now do you know looking back at your times if you look at your five-hour bike split um what did you come up to Harvey at? And then, yeah, do you know what your halfway time was? Um, um, a lot slower. No, I need to look that up. I was aiming for a five hour uh, bike time, but I know that when I rode towards Harvey, I was calculating this will probably be hard to, uh, to get a um, five hour bike time. I yeah. think I was uh, maybe five minutes slower, so that must be to to thirty five or something, or or even more towards Harvey. Really okay. slower than uh, the um, the ride back from Harvey. Um, yeah, obviously because of uh, of the downhill, so you have that uh, that that speed from Harvey, but also because I could uh, keep up my pace in the last thirty uh, k, and that's what right. you actually see in uh, in Kona a lot is that. People are very excited, so they start fast. So in the beginning, people are uh, are taking over. But then in the last 30K, you see a lot of people already struggling with the heat and with energy, and, and they're actually falling back. So if you can keep up your power in yeah. the last 30K, and then maybe the last 5K prepare for the run, so you can ke- uh, do a little bit uh, less, less power in the last yeah. 5K, but let's say the last 30K, keep up the power, then you set yourself up for a, a good a good place in the field uh, yeah. because of that. So the the back half was much faster than uh, than the the first half. But exact What's time, I, I I don't know. I just made the turn in Harvey and then focused on uh, um, being as fast as possible within my uh, power zones. Yeah, right. What um what type of nutrition like uh, what were you taking of S fuels on the bike? Um, for you what was required race plus race plus is uh is my go-to uh fuel and what kind of uh dosage concentration were you using for yourself uh, Xander? 
Yeah, what I what I did, I did some metabolic testing. I, I do that every year. That was since uh, I was uh, having uh, problems with uh, with GI issues. Yeah. So I figured out a couple of years ago that I was just using way too many uh, carbs, carbs and that I also have a hard time in um, consuming the, um, the fructose part. And a lot of those uh, sports drinks, they have a high concentration of fructose as well. So for me, the, the S-Fuels product was, uh, was way better um, because it's uh, the slow release, uh, slow release carb. So, so no, uh, no fructose, no dextrose. And then with the metabolic testing I did, I figured out that I needed for the power that I uh, was aiming for in a full distance between 60 and 70 grams of uh, carbs per hour. And I wanted to um, basically um, all the carbs that I was using throughout the bike uh, ride, I, I would like to uh, replenish to have um, more or less full tank when I started uh, the Start marathon, the because it's obviously much harder to uh, to digest uh, the carbs during the run. Yeah. So for me, that uh, turned out to be between 350 and 400 grams. So I prepared 400 grams of s -Fuels Plus in one bottle uh, behind my saddle. Okay. And I uh, fixed that with a, with a tie wrap to the bike because I didn't want to lose it. I, lose I have it, yeah. a bike where I don't have an internal bladder. So right, right. I wanted to have a secure space. Yeah. And then I created a, a drinking device myself. So maybe you see that on the, on the picture I sent you that I made a straw from the, um, uh, from the bull in the rear towards my uh, extensions so that I could in the, in the arrow position, I okay. could just take the straw and I always had the, um, the safety that I had uh, the 400 uh, grams of, um, of carbs uh, available. And I used that then with uh, just plain water or water with a little bit of uh, salt uh, in it. So that way I can only focus on replenishing the water during the aid stations. I don't want uh, the Gatorade or the cola on the, on the bike. Um, and that was basically my plan. And then I had an, a small arrow bottle on the frame. Yeah. And that was a concentrated um, uh, salt uh, bottle. That was also okay. some, something that then uh, recommended. So then you have basically all your carbs you have with you. So, you. so you're fine with that. You replace the water. You also have cool water. That's also nice to, uh, to have during the ride. And then basically on how you feel, you can add uh, salt uh, as, you, uh, as you would like. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Um, very much in sync with um, what uh, what we've been prescribing. I, 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 every athlete's different, but are you a caffeine user at all in racing, or generally not? Generally not. Yeah, I would okay. Say. Okay. No, I had some uh, caffeine pills with me, but uh, I didn't take them. Maybe I okay. forgot to take them. Uh, <laughs> that might be might be something to to try next time. If uh, with more caffeine, hit a nine thirty, huh? You might uh, hit the hit the caffeine. All right, good. But I, well, I, I drink plenty of coffee, so I had yeah. uh, strong coffee in the morning. Um, I know that I I uh, once ran a marathon where where I uh, used caffeine. I cannot say it made a, a big difference uh, for yeah. me. Although I was uh, listening to a podcast where Jan Ferdina was saying he was uh, topping up with like 100 grams of uh, 100 milligrams of uh, not 100 grams, 100 milligrams of uh, caffeine uh, per hour, which I think is quite a lot. So there, there might be something in in there, but uh, yeah, it needs to be generally it needs to be between two and a half to three milligrams per kilogram of body weight before it affects your fat oxidation. So it will give your fat oxidation an increased uh, bump. But if you're taking a typical coffee tea dose, which is more in the 50 to maybe 100 milligrams on a single cup of coffee, uh, but if you dose up to two and a half to three milligrams per kilogram, so for a 70 kilogram person, that might be two or 240 milligrams um, over, you know, typically for a 70.3 uh, in the first hour and a half of the race. Um, mm -hmm. And then that will last for about six hours before it loses half of its strength. So that's what you would need for a 70.3. For a full distance, you would probably take another hit of that, probably coming off the bike just before you get mm -hmm. on the run. So um, anyway, yep. we can talk more about that. Okay, so you come off the bike. Um, how was the legs as you kind of literally come off the bike and took your first steps in transition no actually in the in the last kilometer on the bike i had uh, slight cramps so i was a little bit worried i thought oh where is this coming from because i thought i nailed everything 
Um, I can remember I had that in a half distance race. Uh, I won earlier this year in uh, in Germany as well. Um, that's maybe I think uh, I I thought it was just because of uh, putting the power down actually, um, and then you change something in your system and your body is just reacting on that. But then to answer your question, when when jumping off the bike, it uh, immediately felt okay. I had no uh, no issues with uh, with cramps uh, at all. Um, I tend to start uh, running a little bit too quickly. So I, in my plan, I had uh, really in my mind that I need to uh, to back down a little bit after uh, after the run. But then after transition, you start to run actually also on a slight uphill, and that's right. also easy then to. Uh, uh, to overdo it um i'm using a power meter the stride power meter okay yeah um i think it's very useful especially on a course like kona because it's it's definitely not a flat course it's a quite a hilly uh marathon and to uh, to pace yourself evenly that's uh especially important uh, in an ironman marathon and that's easier to do that on on power so i was uh, planning for a uh, 260 uh, watt uh, power uh, on average during the run um that's uh, that's also the power that i can produce normally on an uh, on an ironman and i figured out that i was well enough um acclimatized so that i could also uh, push that power on a good day in uh, in kona as well so my plan was to start out on uh, 280 um so in the, in the first k i was uh, a little bit higher i was more to 280 to 290 so i backed down immediately to 260 right. so for whole palani i uh, i was able to run uh, to run that power um i cannot say that it felt comfortable because uh, the the marathon in kona doesn't feel comfortable at all but it felt comfortable enough that i thought okay this is uh, something if i if i prepare myself well enough or if i um, use the education <laughs> wisely that um, that will be um, the power i uh, i can hold for uh, at least until uh, the last 10k 335 uh what were you planning or thinking you would deliver on the day for your marathon time Actually, I was I was planning a little bit faster. So I think 3:30 was my um, my conservative scenario. So uh, although I swam faster, I did a, right. a perfect uh, a race on the bike. The run was um, at least five minutes slower than my uh, than my slowest um, plan. Uh, and I think that was uh, mostly the result of the aid stations. So what I did, I really needed to cool myself. Uh, I used a lot of ice during the run. Right. Um, I wanted to get uh, also the flutes in the, um, and also some uh, some additional uh, carbs. And it was hard to do that during the run and it was already quite crowded on the course. So uh, when you see that the profs, uh, obviously they can they can take the, um, the drinks while running because the aid stations are not crowded. But as an age grouper, especially if yeah, you're in right. the middle 45 category, there's a lot of runners before athletes. you. And yeah. actually there's a whole group of uh, athletes at an aid station. So <laughs> to only be able to take your, uh, right. to take your fluids, you need to basically uh, stop. So I, I went to, um, to a run walk strategy where I walked to the eight stations. Well, Chelsea also did it. Right, uh, right. So I thought, well, and she's also trained by then. So I thought that, 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 that's, uh, that's a wise thing to do. Yeah. But obviously I was not counting for the time lost uh, for walking the eight stations when I made my race plan. So that's also something that you need to consider, which I will consider next time in Kona that uh, there's a lot of aid stations. And if you lose like 30 seconds per aid right. station, you easily lose 30 seconds per aid station. Right. Yeah, that that will cost you easily five minutes. So that's, yeah. that's yeah. five minutes. But no. Um, no, after all, I'm not not uh, not disappointed on my run at all. But I think I can do faster. So uh, still need to figure out what what I need to do to to be faster on the run in Kona because I think also my preparations have been uh, really good. Um, but that's something I'm I'm for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I see some uh, some potential for uh, for improvement. Yeah, good. Well, that's some great learnings there. Um, if you were to wind it back, or like you said, I'm, I'm I'm happy that you're planning already to do it again. What what do you think in training uh, you would do differently, or do more of, or less of? You think in uh, next uh, Kona uh, plans? Um, I think overall. I would um, prepare myself um, 
the same in terms of lots of volume. The, the total volume you need to do uh, needs to be there. I, I, yeah. Or at least I need it. Yeah. Um, I can't do a lot more because I'm also uh, a full-time professional, finance professional. So um, um, I'm not going to work half-time for, uh, for racing Kona. Um, also, regarding the heat acclimation, I don't think I can do better than I, than I used to do. But my swim needs to improve, so at least I need to to work on uh, technique um, even more than I did, and that's that's a long term process. So yeah. uh, ramping it up from five swims to seven swims a week that's not possible within the time I have available. But I'm confident if I can do this for another couple of years and and, right. and keep on uh, training with uh, with technique trainers that my swim time can improve just by focusing on that. So not, not, not swimming harder, but uh, swimming more easily. Yeah. And then I need to do something to have a better run after uh, the bike in hot conditions. Um, and maybe I can improve that by doing a little bit more runs off the bike. I know that Dan already plans quite a lot of runs off the bike. Um, but if I look back to my preparation, sometimes I was not able to do the run off the bike immediately. So right. it, it, it became a run the same day, but not yeah. just after not biking. Break. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that might be something uh, to improve on. Um, and also after long bike, bike rides, eh, have, a, have a decent uh, right. uh, run off the bike. So not only like a 15 minute uh, run off the bike, but maybe half an hour or three quarters of an hour. Yeah. It needs to be somewhere in, 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 in those areas. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, that, thank you. I mean, I think, um, the, uh, the ambassador team and others just love hearing kind of some of the small tips, right. That you learn from other athletes, um, 2023, what's, uh, what are you thinking? What are you planning? Or maybe you're not planning anything yet. Um, but, uh, any ideas? Yeah, I, I qualified for the World Championships uh, 70.3 in Lati, which is in, oh, Finland. Right. in Finland. So I love yeah. to go back to, uh, to Finland again uh, and then the championship race. That's uh, the end of uh, August. August. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do full distances next year because also uh, I have some, some work uh, commitments uh, that are a little bit right. uh, um, more demanding than the last uh, two years. Um, so I'm aiming, um, yeah, I haven't told my wife, but uh, uh, I definitely want to go back to Kona, but that will not be, be for next year. It's also uh, because it's um, quite expensive uh, these yeah. days, especially if you're not from, from the US. Yeah. yeah. So I, I need to save a little bit for that, but um, I'm, um, the, the longer term goal would be to, to go back to Kona and then to see if I can, uh, can beat my own time there. And then I'm a little bit older, so maybe then <laughs> be more competitive uh, and, and come closer to, la let's say, the top 10 of the, of the age group. That would be, right. uh, would be nice. Yeah. The next uh, couple of years, I think the focus will be on, on half distances right. uh, combined with some uh, marathon running. Well, hey, on behalf of the whole team, thank you for your support this year uh, in the Endure IQ, Asfuels and uh, Purpose team. Uh, no we as I said earlier, we love the photos of you uh, crossing the finish lines. Uh, great to see someone super excited, um, maybe relieved at some of these, finishing some of these races. But uh, it's been great working with you and all the best for 2023. And uh, congratulations on an awesome uh, Kona race, uh, Xander. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me and uh, thanks for being part of the team. It's, it's a great experience. Yeah, you're welcome. Good. Well, all the best and we'll catch up soon. And thanks for joining us again, folks. And uh, we'll put some of those links, like we said, down in the show notes and you can check out some of the tools that Xander used at uh, this year's Ironman World Championships in Kona. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.